Good evening. I'm Elise Adler, Director of Events for Parnassus Books, and we are delighted to share tonight's event featuring Fabio Zucker. He is a writer and a journalist, and he is here to celebrate his incredible new book, The Life and Death of a Minky Whale in the Amazon. And just as a reminder, you can purchase copies of that incredible book from Parnassus. And we'll go ahead and put the link to make those purchases uh, available for you tonight. Fabio has agreed to take questions. So please go ahead and ask them. You can put them in the Facebook comments or you can put them in the YouTube chat. And Fabio will do his best to answer those questions throughout the course of the evening. Tonight, Fabio is in conversation with Ezra Fitz who is the translator for this book and former managing editor for Turner Publishing. And it is my pleasure to turn it over to Fabio and Ezra. Well, thank you, Elise, so much for welcoming us and, and thanks to all your colleagues there at Parnassus. Um, we're, uh, we're thrilled, we did the, uh, cover reveal for this book with you guys. I can't remember when, maybe back in the fall. Um, so it's great to be back. Um, I wish I could be there in person being a Middle Tennessee resident myself. But um, yeah, thank you for, for having us both. And um, Fabio, I'll just, uh, I'll start by, by saying, uh, it's been a long time coming for this book, hasn't it? Um, it's, it's hard to picture uh, life before the pandemic uh, sometimes, but actually it was before the pandemic um, in 2020 when I was in New York uh, uh, talking with Daniel Slager, the, the publisher at Milkweed about this book. And that's kind of when we decided, you know, absolutely, we, I told him you need to publish this book. And he said, okay, question number two, would you translate it? And I was like, you know, I would love to. So, um, you know, that was over right about two years ago now, a little more, um, but uh, it's appropriate because, uh, um, you know, it's not just Brazil or South America that depends on the Amazon as a means of maintaining a livable climate here. Um, it's the whole planet. Um, so it makes sense that we would want to bring this, bring your, uh, our, your reporting into the English language world. Um, this, this is why we see people like uh, Leonardo DiCaprio getting into Twitter feuds with your president, uh, Bolsonaro. You know, there was a great back and forth where Bolsonaro told Leo he needs to keep his mouth shut, mind his own business, but, but Leo came back and said, hey, and I think this is a quote, uh, you know, what happens there matters to us all. Um, and Leo you know, donated something like $5 million to, um, Pro Amazon preservation efforts, um, you know. So back in you know 2020 and even back in 2019, you know we all saw around the world the satellite images of the uh, wildfires in the rainforest. Um, even the uh, Brazil's the director of Brazil's version of NASA um, was uh, uh, broadcasting those throughout the world, and and uh, that was around the time you were actually writing the story. Um, in this book, the one titled The Forest in Flames. And you could actually uh, feel the ash from the fires raining down. Um, it must have been a terrifying experience, um, horrifying really. So my first question to you tonight would be, you know, can you tell us uh, today, now that the book is about to be published, um, are things getting any better? Are, are the fires uh, dwindling at all? Um, and uh, what are the chances that Bolsonaro gets defeated this fall? Thank you don't you. have to answer that one. Go with the first okay. two. Yeah, thank you. Thank you so much, Ezra. And thank you, Parnassus, for having me, having us tonight. It's a real pleasure for me to be here. And you know, you, you've been talking that it's a long time since we started working on this book. And for me, it's, of course, even longer because the first story is um, the, actually the first, the very first story of the book, the demarcation of the Tupinamba territory, the, the self-demarcation of the Tupinamba territory, goes back to 2017. So 
it's um, almost some five years now. Um, or 2016, if I'm not mistaken, sorry, I, I don't remember exactly the, 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 the year now, but well, the, the point is that um, this um, the, the story that you're mentioning, forests in flames, um, a burning forest, it's also, um, it, it's also together with the Tupinamba. Um, I was um, doing my field work, my, my field work in anthropology and ethnography, long-term ethnography that I that I've been conducting with this Tupinamba indigenous group in at the, at the banks of the Tapajos River, when we were discussing like um, what was being broadcasted on television, was suddenly happening a few kilometers uh, down this a big highway for soy export named BR163, and I thought it it it, it, it would be an interesting piece to write about this reflection on crossing the river and feeling the ashes and seeing the smoke behind the National Tapajos Forest. And you know, since then, this was in 2019, since then, uh, I think, um, I'm afraid to say that things got worse actually. And if we compare deforestation, and it's important to say that fires in a wet forest, in a tropical forest, can only occur if there is an ongoing, a very advanced stage of deforestation. So deforestation has increased a lot during the three and a half less years with Bolsonaro. We just take the, the, the measures from uh, the INPI, which is the Brazilian equivalent of NASA. And if you compare the three years of the Bolsonaro um, government with the three years prior, to his uh, election, we have a speak in deforestation, the whole forest, and that's pretty clear from the data. Um, we have from, to, from April 2022, it shows the worst April ever recorded in terms of deforestation in the forest. So I don't think that things are getting better, I'm afraid to say, but if Bolsonaro won't be reelected, and I think there is a big chance that he won't be, um, we need to understand how is it going to be like when Lula, the former president of Brazil, center-left president, how is it going to be like if he's in power? Because he's also the one responsible for the building, for the creation of that, for the uh, reinstallation of the Belo Monte Dam project, which is another chapter on the book. Belo Monte is a huge dam, the Xingu River, and it was a project from the military back in the 70s. And Lula recreated it. So I think we still have to understand what kind of, are we going to have an eco Lula, eco friendly, friendly to the Amazon? I think that's a big question. I, I don't have answers to that, but I'm curious to keep on reporting on this. Yeah. Um, and to follow up on that, uh, you mentioned um, working with uh, Tupinamba uh, villagers, the indigenous community. and. And that reminds me of one of my favorite anecdotes um, that you write about in the book was when some of the uh, some of the indigenous Tupinamba villagers uh, sent you into town to buy shotgun shells and some other equipment before you went out um, to spend a week or so in the rainforest doing your demarcating their 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 native territory. Um, and that was really a very it sounded like a very tense but very funny in the end story. Um, so I, I encourage all you people who get the book to, to pay attention for that. Um, so what I want to ask you about is you spent a lot of time um, with various uh, indigenous peoples, you know, listening to them, um, going on, uh, on uh, hikes to demarcate their territory, earning their trust. Um, and that's, that's what I want to uh, learn from you is how did you manage to uh, gain the trust of uh, so many um, indigenous peoples when um, so many other Brazilians like Bolsonaro or his supporters are pushing for even more deforestation, even more mining, even more uh, corporate uh, monoculture uh, farming, um, both in the rainforest and in the indigenous lands. How did you manage to connect with these indigenous people? Yeah, I think that, that that's a good question because it always comes a moment when you say, you know, I'm a journalist, I want to write this story. I think this is something that deserves to be reported. There's always a moment when they 
try to understand the like an inquiry on me they like start asking about my past about what I'm, what I'm doing there what are my intentions and I think that first of all I try to be the most sincere possible like explaining what is a journalistic work what is is, is it important to tell their stories and what I the way I want to tell and also that you know, as a journalist, I also need to listen to the other side, and I quite, I'm quite frank to make, um, to explain to, 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 to these groups of people. And, you know, they do know that there are Brazilians, non-Indigenous Brazilians that works with NGOs and other reporters that are doing this kind of work and have a ethical commitment towards these communities and they understand that um, I'm going to develop a sincere work and it also happens that you know i've been doing this for six seven years now so my name has circulated a bit they have recommendations from other indigenous groups and they can assure that you know i'm gonna do a decent job uh, reporting on the situation that i'm not gonna just uh, write something that can be racist against them or harmful to them but that i'm gonna do serious reporting and try to understand the situation the best I can, understand other actors are also playing, such as big farmers, because I also need to interview the big farmers. I mean, this is this is narrative journalism, but it still is investigative journalism. And I need to listen to all the players in order to understand what is happening in these situations. Yeah. Um... You definitely um, did an amazing job of, uh, of reaching out to people on both sides of the issue. Um, and um, you'll see in some, any reader will see in some of the other chapters um, what the responses of the indigenous peoples are like and how it compares with the, uh, the, uh, the people um, trying to modernize, for lack of a better word, the Amazon. It, it's, um, it makes me think of the slogan on the Brazilian flag, Orne progresso, you know, order and progress. Um, is it progress progressing for the better or is it for the worse? You know, depends on what you, what you, um, how you perceive that. Um, and speaking of the people you interview, uh, one of the most uh, memorable uh, individuals, at least for me, um, was affectionately referred to as Mr. Manioc um, after the Portuguese word for casaba or yuca. Um, and uh, Mr. Maniac was forced from his own uh, farmland by a corporate soy, big agro, um, buying up acre after acre of land. Um, and uh, you know they they were not only planting the uh, the soy everywhere they could, but they were also uh, spraying their fields with the toxic pesticides. And you, there's one part where you talk about the uh, corporate farms literally go right out to the edge of the property of a, of a local um, elementary school and the, the children are out playing in the playground while these you know, big um, tractors are coming by uh, spraying pesticide in, literally into the wind, um, which is where the title of the chapter comes from, the poison fields. Um, and Mr. Manioc, uh, you know, he tried to hold on as long as he could uh, every time big agriculture would move in and buy up more land. He would move on to a new location. Um, and uh, so I guess my question in this case would be, um, uh, what does Mr. Manioc have to look forward to or expect um, in the future? Um, I don't know if you've, I know some of the people in the book you've been in touch with um, since you first interviewed them, but uh, what, so what chance do people like him have um, subsistence farmers and small villages have in the face of these, uh, the, the encroachment of, of uh, these agro businesses, these corporate farmers. Yeah, thank you, thank you, thank you for this question. I think it's an important one because um, for this question, I can also mention what I think is another important layer of my work. It's not exactly um, the core of the work or it's not 100% explicit as a, problem in the book, but I think for the pages, what I'm trying to do also is to show that these indigenous communities, they have another conception of progress. And I think that's really important because the, what 
we call progress or what we call, for example, as you said, modernization, I think it's the imposition of a single version of what progress can mean. Whereas for them, progress means something completely different. It means um, development, sustainable development with the forest standing and with a multiple form of um, relation with these multiple species. And I think it's important to, to think of the forest also as a technological device. I think that's something that's kind of present in the book, um, but something I, I, I still want to explore more. Like what if we start thinking about the forest as an essential infrastructure for our futures? I mean, it, it's just impossible to think about life on this planet without the Amazon forest. And the Amazon forest was not just there. You know, we have this sexist vision of the forest as a virgin, virgin untouched forest. That doesn't exist, that's bullshit. What exists is these communities were domesticating species, they were building canals, they were uh, constructing the forest through thousands and thousands of years. And what I think, uh, so, so, so I think they, they have an, their own conception of progress and somehow these books express these conceptions of what a social development for them mean together with the forest. And I'm afraid to say that for people like Mr. Maniok, unfortunately, I haven't been in touch with him. There are so many, you know, as a journalist, you meet new people every day and it's hard to keep in touch with everyone the same uh, depth of re uh, relation and attention. But um, I'm afraid that for people like him in a short term, uh, the, the, the future, the short future is not very promising and the forestation keep on increasing. But again, um, I, I also think that I'm an optimist and I think that this situation will change. And what we're seeing in the last years, it's also like the last moment that this so clear form of violence and destruction and human rights violations are occurring this way because you know, as you said in the introduction, the, this forest matters to the whole world. And, I think our, our, our approach to, to the Amazon forest is changing. Yeah. Um, I really like how you um, referred to uh, the, the infrastructure of the forest um, and how it's been, you know, present for, you know, for, for millennia. Because <clears throat> one of the things that uh, struck me, um, um, you know, I've been to Brazil, um, but I don't, um, I don't have like a, the same, uh, I guess, perception or understanding of, uh, of just how vast the Amazon River Basin is um, and how, how much water there is. Um, and like, um, I always thought about how in the Amazon Basin, you know, when you were going from village to village, interviewing people um, in, the, in the Amazon River Basin, you know, rivers and tributaries, those are like the highways and the roads. Um, you know, here in Tennessee, we talk about, you know, you'd say, take, take 65 North or 65 South um, to get to Nashville. But in the Amazon, it's more of a question, you know, are we going upstream to, to this village? Or are we going downstream? And how much time does it take to go by boat every way? Um, and if, you know, if you go to Memphis, you can look across the Mississippi River and see Arkansas, but when you travel around the Amazon, you talk about how it, I mean, it's a river, but you talk about how it really feels like an ocean. That's how vast and massive it is. And I have a quote here, um, you write, you are a speck in the middle of the sea, even while you're in the heart of the largest rainforest on the planet. So I was hoping you could tell us, um, what it's like for indigenous Brazilians to be do so dependent on water um, for everything from transportation, from getting from village to village to food um, during a period of time right now, when, as you say, um, nature herself is drying up. Thank you, yeah. I think you, 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 you finished with this, uh, the title of one of my favorite chapters on the book too, it's uh, Nature Herself is Drying Up. A Quilombo on the Marajó Archipelago feels the impact of rice paddies amid turbulent times. And 
uh, this is the story about this Quilombo. Quilombo is a, um, uh, it's a community of Afro-Brazilian Afro community with an uh, historic of struggle against raci racism. And they are um, communities that run away from um, slavery. They were former enslaved uh, communities that um, fought for the liberty in the past. And I think it's also um, uh, an important aspect in their lives because they are in this delta. It's a big island, the Marajoa is a big island um, in the delta of the Amazon River when it meets the Atlantic Ocean. And you can imagine how rich in terms of, of biodiversity this region is, but it's the forest is being turned down to, 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 to installations of, to, to the create and to open space for the creation of rice monoculture fields. And I think in this chapter, we can have a glimpse, we can have an idea of how their life, their lives are dependent on the on, on water. So in order to go from one place to the other, I, I actually don't have cars, you just go by boat. And in this archipelago, uh, there are because of the tide, the chains of the tide, you can only go to certain places in specific hours. So if the tide is going up, you cannot just go against the tide going up. It, I mean, you it would be almost impossible. And what's happening now is that the waterways that they used to, you know, sell their acai, sell their so it's a very important berry from the Amazon. I think you have heard about it. Um, all these waterways they use to go to the city uh, are now drying. And as an impact of this um, rice monoculture project, but also because of climate change. And with that, the dying of small shrimps, the, their diet is very based on, and you have a whole ecological um, disturb, dis disturbing um, the, dis the disturbing of this whole ecological system because of the rice paddy. So I try to reflect in this story of, of how um, this killing of species and how it's impacting human life through the chains in water patterns to show how much they are dependent on waters. And they yeah. also have this very conception that it, it's not in the story. Unfortunately, I, I, I couldn't put that in the story. You know, sometimes you have to cut and edit, but they, they have this very interesting reflection of the river as, um, as a big snake. And this is something you find in very different Amazonian groups, this reflection of the river as a kind of mother snake, which is also present in the story that gives title to the book. And there I do talk about this uh, indigenous myths of the snakes which is a story of the the, the, mink and death of a, the life and death of a minky whale. Yeah, um, there are there are such great um, stories within stories to to get from this book. Um, and uh, I wanted to talk um, definitely, um, you know, we've talked about the uh, the agricultural, we've talked about the, the, the rivers. Um, um, but I want to uh, spend a little more time talking about um, the indigenous populations that you report about. Um, you know, we're still living, um, it makes me think of the Garcia, no Garcia Marquez novel, Love in the Time of Cholera. We're still living in the time of COVID. Um, and towards the end of the book, you write about the first indigenous person in Brazil to die of COVID. Uh, her name was Dona Luisa a local leader who helped establish a, um, an important spiritual festival that had been banned by a uh, Catholic priest back in the 1940s. Um, so I, I was hoping for those who haven't read yet, uh, maybe you could um, give them a little um, little preview of, or tell, tell us some more about how indigenous communities, um, communities responded to the pandemic. Yeah, that's a topic I've been working on for the last two years. I think the first story, this was not the first story actually, but it's like the second or the third one that I wrote about how the pandemic is impacting indigenous communities. Um, I kept on writing about that also after uh, we finished translating the book, between the translation and the publication of the book. And I think it's um, 
It's actually very sad because, you know, when the pandemic hit, we thought that the indigenous communities, they were far away from the big centers. They wouldn't be suffering that much because of the, the virus. They wouldn't be, um, the, their, their death, what we thought is that the death, lethality, and contamination would be lower than in big urban centers. But because actually, they so, so isolated. Because they're more isolated, yeah. yeah. Like you, you, the virus shouldn't get there as fast as it arrived in Sao Paulo or Rio, for example. But what actually happened is that, you know, they have a communal life. They share, they have a shared life. Life, if not in shared um, houses, because this is not 100% present in all the indigenous communities. Some of them had family houses, but um, by sharing food, by having a communal form of life, and also the lack of infrastructure, of, of health infrastructure, was a big reason for the indigenous in Brazil showing a death lethality much higher than the national average. And also, I think what I try to report on since the pandemic hit is that the territories which are most affected by social environmental conflicts are the territories that have the higher death lethality. And for example, you can see that in the last chapter of the book about Belo Monte Dam, the dam that I just mentioned that was built during the Lula Gilma years, the center-left party that ruled Brazil at the beginning of the 20th century. And um, because, and then we come again to this question on the dependence of on water and fish reproduction became almost impossible with the construction of the Belo Monte Dam. The fish cannot uh, reproduce any longer. They are dying with uh, the eggs inside them. So I tried to write this story following um, the impact of these communities that cannot sustain their, themselves. What was pretty striking for me was that at some point I was reporting the pandemic and said, you know, they are hungry in the communities because they cannot produce food. They depend on the food that comes from the city. So, you know, it made me feel, think what kind of ecological, territorial disturbance has been created by uh, the implantation of this dam or all the uh, def deforestation projects uh, in the region to make them be unable to have a food uh, to have their food security. Yeah, it's um, it's tremendous how this and this bring, makes me think back to uh, what you were talking about a few minutes ago about about the nature of progress, um, and uh, and how it can. Um, be a sword that cuts both ways. Um, that makes me think of um, how you talked about uh, the relationship between quote unquote modern medicine um, and the uh, the practices of um, indigenous wisdom, which they've of, of their of healing, which they've you know gained over over hundreds of years. Um, you write you write about the 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 Kumua, which is uh, an indigenous figure. Um, defined by, by whites as under the generic term of page or, or what we call a shaman in English. Um, one of the people you interviewed describes the Kumua as uh, the keeper of the body's formulas. That was a quote from the book. Uh, someone who has the ability to summon healing and protective properties. Um, indigenous people in the Amazon have centuries of acquired medical knowledge. Um, but you talk in the book about how quote unquote modern medicine or Western medicine can often be dismissive of their wisdom. Um, there's a specific example that you write about where a young girl is bitten by a, a pit viper and the, um, the medical doctors at the, uh, the big hospital wanted to amputate her foot. I thought that was the only way to save her life. Um, and uh, you know, they, if, if she were um, of a different religion, you know, her, her a different spiritual advisors would be, would be allowed to come visit at the hospital, but the, the, the Kumu would not be allowed to visit her um, and offer, you know, his, um, his um, ceremonial um, blessings. Um, anyway, long story short, after a long legal battle, the girl was treated at, at an outpatient center facility run by indigenous people 
and she survived. She has a nasty scar on her on her ankle, but she still kept her foot. They did not have to amputate. So um, when we look at kind of uh, clashes between um, you know longstanding indigenous wisdom and and health uh, clashing with with modern medicine. It almost seems like it's trying to impose itself, trying to, it's concerned progress. You know, we have a, we can have a hospital in the middle of the Amazon and, and Western medicine, it's seen as, as, a, as, a, as progress being made. Um, so what is it like, um, maybe you can tell us more about this, this conflict, this clash, um, and are, the, are, are there people who are starting to actually respect the, uh, the practices of the Kumoa, what they can, what they can do with their um, ancestral knowledge? Yeah, I think that's a great question because, you know, after a few years um, visiting and dealing with these indigenous words and indigenous stories and the way they um, reflect on the processes they have been living for the last decades, I have the impression that also, um, in the literature, in the anthropological literature about the Amazon, that's a point that uh, many scholars write about, that there are the indigenous philosophies, the indigenous ways of, of understanding the world. It's uh, much more open for combining different cultural backgrounds. So it's, also, it's always a, um, an, uh, um, a perspective that you can add it's never either this or that, as let's say in our culture, or especially in the conservative way of Western, that Western culture conceives cultural identity. And we can think about that, like the far right movements in Europe, in the US, or even Latin America, they, are, they, they have this feeling that, you know, you're losing something. We're, we're not essentially what we used to be. Whereas in the indigenous world, I think it's always a combination of different cultures, always adding. And for these indigenous groups uh, in the, the upper Black River, the Alto Rio Negro, uh, I've, I follow this uh, very interesting character and he's an anthropologist, an indigenous anthropologist himself, um, Paulo, João Paulo. And, and he, um, and he's, he, I, I followed him on the way back to his village after 15 years, he has been in the city of Manaus and not visiting his relatives. And, you know, none of them would tell you, we don't want Western medicine. None of the shamans, none of the kumuans would tell you, no, I don't want the hospital. I don't want to have this treatment. What they are claiming is to have their own forms of treatment equally considered as a therapy, as a body therapy that works and have actual effects in the lives of, this, of, the, of the people they are healing. So I think it's important to, to, to understand that through their perspective, they, can, they, they want to, you know, they don't want to be just equal to the priests visiting and having the, the, the blessings. They want to be equal to the doctor, the physicist that is healing the patient. And I, I went to this uh, healing center that they, they have in Manaus. It's uh, a center for indigenous people to, to, to get treatment. And have side by side the Western medicine doctor and the Kumu. And I think that's a, a, an amazing experiment. I mean, it's very restricted. It's very um, limited to a, a specific experiment, social experiment that João Paulo and the Kumu are conducting. But I think it's something that I try to put an, put attention on because I think it's very powerful as a social experimentation. Yeah, um, and on that note, I'd like to uh, point out, um, this may not be obvious to, to readers of the book, but all the uh, wonderful artwork that accompanies your text um, was done by an indigenous uh, artist. Uh, um, so maybe you could tell us like how important is it to see the Amazon region through the eyes and through the art of, of an indigenous person like Gustavo? Yeah, well, it's a great pleasure to work with Gustavo, Gustavo Caboclo. He's the artist that uh, did the um, cover and, um, and the, the, the drawings inside the book. 
and and I think you know he, he's able to express in his art he, he's able to do exactly that what I was mentioning before to combining different words for his art and you can see that in a very creative way so you know you, you, the figures are always um, kind of like disconstructed in their humanities you don't have very clear human figures and I think that's also part of an indigenous world and you know, Gustavo it's, it's a great artist he became Although we never met because of the pandemic, we just had online meetings, but I feel like we can consider itself with each other um, um, friends. And it's been, it's been great to work with him. And it's an honor for me to have this book with his, um, with his drawings, with his illustration. Yeah, it's really like having like a third, a third person chipping, ch uh, chime in, you know, you and then me trying to translate what you wrote and then, and then he contributes the, the the art, the visualism, um, yeah. to bring it all together. Um, I'm gonna, I'm gonna ask, uh, do one more question, and I think we we might have some um, questions from um, from listeners. Um, so I'm gonna, I'm gonna ask one more important question, and then we'll maybe open it up a little bit to questions from the audience. Um, so, of course, we have to talk about the whale. That's the title of the book. We can't have this discussion without talking about the minke whale. Um, and uh, for, for anyone who hasn't read it yet, um, it really is um, something that could have come straight out of a Hollywood set. You know, here's a massive sea creature appears on the banks of a small village, literally hundreds of miles away from the Atlantic Ocean and uh, cut to a scene at a, at a bar or pub where a veterinarian is shooting pool with some friends and he gets an emergency phone call um, and has to uh, hop on a, I think it was, was it a helicopter or a pontoon plane? And it took like four or five planes to get there. Yeah, um, to, um, to get to this, the location of, um, I think what, the, what the, uh, the locals call the, they call it the place where the whale appeared to this day. Um, so, so he flies off and the quest to save the, the animal begins. Um, and of course we know from the title, it does not have a happy ending, unfortunately for the, for the whale. Um, but it's such an important chapter and, I, and it, it makes perfect sense. It's the one you'd use for the title. Um, you call this, this incredible event. And I mean, literally it's almost incredible. How could a marine mammal wind up in the middle of the rainforest? You call it a, a poetic conception, and you talk about how it served as a way for locals to, to add meaning to the way the world is changing around them. You know, here's something that they'd never experienced before. This is, it's emblematic of, of, of all the different changes, all the things that are changing around them are kind of symbolized in this, in this whale's arrival. Um, so maybe you could tell us, um, those of us who haven't read it, a little more about how these these local villages, these communities, uh, came together um, in attempting to to care for the whale, and, maybe, and you know maybe even save it. They they really believed they could. They came up with some amazing theories about how they could possibly keep this animal alive. Yeah, thank you. Yeah, well, I think this is definitely my favorite story. In the book and that's why it, the, the book has the title after the story it's, it's named after the story and um you know my former editor Katia Brazil she 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 called me and said hey, I wanted to write about this story it's been 10 years that the whale appeared in the Tapajós this region that I know very well and she said I think you were the perfect person to go there because actually nobody went there to tell the story of the whale and I was thinking about myself, well, it's been 10 years. I think they, they will remember the way, of course, because it's such an extraordinary event in their lives, but what can I write about this story? So what I decided to do is that um, I started reading what, at least for me, it's my big reference on literature and whales, which is, of course, Moby Dick. Um, so I went to, to the Amazon reading Moby, Moby Dick, the... the, the yeah. There's a, there's a Moby Dick quote in the book. Exactly. Found. Yeah. And what I decided to do was also very influenced by 
perhaps um, you, you, you read this story, Consider the Lobster by David Foster Wallace, that he goes to a, a lobster um, fair in Maine and starts, you know, he follows the lobster, but the lobster is also an excuse to talk about uh, this event and some uh, specific political situations he's witnessing. So I said, okay, so I'm gonna do that with the whale. I'm gonna follow the, the traces the whale left in this region as also the, 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 the occasion to debate what are they passing through in terms of the pressure from the uh, agribusiness, the use of pesticides and the history of these communities. And you know, their extraordinary attempt to save the life of this whale because that's an amazing story. They thought they could, you know, put the whale inside uh, between two boats and go down the Tapajos River, then down all the Amazon River back to the Atlantic Ocean, like carrying the whale between two boats. It's almost a thousand kilometers. I don't know how long is that miles, but it's quite impressive to, to, to go yeah, that. 600 something miles, yeah. And you know, the, the other idea they had, which would also have been impossible, uh, is um, about, they, they wanted to create a, a, a lake uh, an artificial lake inside their community. They wanted to uh, dig this big hole and, you know, um, feed uh, the, the, the whale with fishes, which would be also not a very good idea because the whale, it's uh, krill and not fishes. But yeah. I think this is also part of like the extraordinary stories of an attempt to save the whales and of their care to this animal and as a, as a part of, you know, their environment and their lives. Yeah. Um, so now that we know where the title comes, <coughs> excuse me, um, another, it looks like we have a couple questions. So we'll, um, I'll, I'll, I'll read the question to you um, and then you can respond. And, and if we have a little bit of time, maybe you can read, a, read something from the book for us. Um, so here's, um, here's the first one. Fabio, uh, can you tell us more about the agribusiness people? How do they try to justify their activities in the Amazon? How can we here in the US help save the Amazon and its people? Um, so um, I think the agribusiness people, the, the, the farmers, the big farmers, they justify their activities by a very specific and already and ready-made speech that they are trying to feed the world. They're trying to fight hunger, which is a very uh, strong argument. If you think about the current state of hunger in, in, in both in Brazil and other Latin American countries and in very different parts of the world. So um, that's the way they justify it. And I think it's a, it's a clever formulation. But at the same time, what I've been trying to show on my reporting is that by saying they're fighting hunger, they are also creating very uh, bad situations for the communities that are side by side with these um, farms, these monoculture, monocrop farms. So it's a pretty contradictory speech to say we're fighting hunger, but you're creating hunger on the communities around you. And you know, the Amazonian communities, either riverside traditional communities are not indigenous, or the indigenous communities, or this quilombola Afro-Brazilian co communities, they have a strong relation with their lands. You know, they, 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 they build their bodies in a very, um, in a, a co-composition of their bodies and their territories. And that's passed for food. Food is essential in this process. That's something I'm working a lot on my dissertation in anthropology also. And uh, what, what I think is very also uh, something we need to pay attention in this process is the way, you know, by making these people go uh, leave their territories, it's a process of expulsation from their territories, you're creating people more dependent on the market and that are not fishing, they, do, they, they don't do their own family agriculture. And to come to the, to, to the second question then, I think it's also important to, to, to reflect on, you know, our, what, what's our role. And I think, um, I would say that 
you know, I'm, I'm not a big fan of these ideas of, you know, um, conscious consumption, like a green consumption. Of course, I'm, I, I'm not here to say, you know, you can just uh, don't recycle your garbage. That's not my point. But I think it's much more useful and much more powerful to pressure government, to pressure um, politicians and to pressure companies. Because these farmers, they're only doing that because there are so many huge companies and financial institutions in the whole world and American institutions, European institutions, Chinese institutions that are putting money on that and are profiting on that. So I think, you know, it's, it's, a, it's a structural problem. It's more, it's more like how to put pressure on these companies. Um, I'm working a story now with like this, uh, these abattoirs, meat abattoirs that are buying from um, uh, farmers that grow their cattle inside indigenous lands. And you know, this meat goes to multinational companies in the whole world, in Europe, in the, in, the, in the United States. So I think that's the question, you know, how to put pressure on the companies and how to make them accountable. And well, that's this what I'm trying to do with journalism, but I think also like by pressuring the government and the politicians a good way. Now, I think I should read the third question for you, Ezra, because it's for you. Should I read it? <laughs> Go ahead. Okay, so that's a question I have also. I was never able, um, I never had the opportunity to ask you that. So Ezra, the translation is very smooth and natural. Was it hard to rewrite this in English? Uh, I'll, I'll answer it by saying this, it would have been uh, a lot harder if I didn't have your help. And uh, as you know, it was really a co-translation. Like I, if I wasn't able to consult you and say, um, can you can you help me understand this better? Can you explain this better? Oh, I've been photobombed. <laughs> um, but yeah, the, uh, um, it really was a, a a blessing that a lot of translators don't don't have access to, um, to be able to uh, speak with the author like that, um, and we also have to uh, um, give a nod of appreciation to Sophie, our editor, who also um, is fluent in Portuguese, and uh, she could put you know yet a, a third pair of eyes on the translation, and um, and say you know I know I know the She'd say, you know, I know you guys went over this, like, what if we said it this way or something like that? So this really was um, a collaborative work and, and it's, it's better for that. We, we had, a, you know, really an embarrassment of riches when it came to translating this book. You're, you're being modest. I want also to compliment you on the, on the translation. Everybody comments, it's a terrific work you've done. And I, I think for, like, for me, it was, very impressive to see the way you translated very specific, you know, folkloric expressions from the Amazon and finding their correspondences in English it was an amazing job you've done. And I feel really yeah. glad you had this conversation. There's a there's a there's a controversy or debate in, in translating. It's when you translate something, do you try to domesticate it? Do you try to make it more palatable to an English audience, or do you try to maintain you know, I hate using the word exotic when talking about something like like a, a, a rainforest with indigenous people. But, or do you, you know, that's the other side. Do you try to um, maintain the the uh, the foreignness of it, this, the strangeness of it? Um, and you know, here we didn't want to make the uh, the we didn't want to try to make the Amazon River sound like the Mississippi River. You know, we did not want to domesticate anything. In that in that sort of way, so um, what readers are reading here is is reading really um, you know firsthand account of what what life in the Amazon River Basin is. Um, so yeah, we're um, we've got a few minutes left. Why don't um, why don't you read the uh, um, the passage that you that you've selected? Great. Um... I'm just going to read the, 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 the final part of this chapter that we've been mentioning in this conversation. It's Forest in Flames, the name of the chapter. And I, I just would we read three paragraphs of it. Those are the last three paragraphs. And the subtitle is Elegy to an Amazonian River. So it goes like that. Sometimes 
I found, I find my, I find myself thinking of this text as an elegy, but not for long. An elegy is a farewell, an expression of regret in the name of someone who has gone, whether dead or distant, leaving behind the person who is writing. To call this text an elegy to the Tapajós River would be like signing its death certificate, which is not within my power. But there is no shortage of reasons to suspect that the river is dying, or rather, that it's being murdered. Hydroelectric plants, gold mining, deforestation, and dredging, to name just a few. As a landscape, the lower Tapajós River Basin is as natural as any human construct. Donateca, one of the oldest residents of Piquiatuba, the place where the whale appeared, can see the river from her home. We enjoy the sunset together from her wide open kitchen overlooking the waters. At night, we sleep, rocking to the rhythm of the waters. In contrast with the serenity of the moment, she laments the effects hydroelectric dams have had on the river and on her life. She fears an increase in diseases and the departure of local fish populations. The river has changed color, she remarks. It's darker. No response comes to my mind. I remain silent. Yeah, that's a, a beautiful but sad passage. Kind of a, really does um, surmise the, uh, the, um, the tone of the book. It, the Amazon is a amazingly beautiful part of the world and it's in a sad state of affairs at the moment. Um, but um, we are grateful that we have journalists like you who are covering it and, and reporting on it and uh, you know, laying, laying out for all of us to see um, what's going on and what needs to be done. Um, I just want to thank you um, and other journalists that I know, like Jorge Ramos, um, you know, who are doing the, um, there's a, Jorge always likes to uh, talk about, uh, it's a word in Spanish, you probably have one in Portuguese too, contra poder, which is very hard to translate. We don't have a literal one, but it's, it's kind of like, um, you know, a speaking truth to power um, and um, reporting the truth and, and, and describing things exactly as they are. So thank you for, for that um, and the opportunity to bring this into English. I want to thank Parnassus too uh, for hosting this event um, and for making the book available. Um, if you haven't seen one yet, it's a beautiful book thanks to the uh, design from, from Milkweed Editions. And if you haven't got a copy yet, make sure you get it from, from your indie booksellers like Parnassus and not that massive corporation that shares a name with a, with a certain river in Brazil. Um, we'll, we'll leave that company unsaid, but I think you know what I'm talking about. Um, so with that, uh, yeah. Thank you, Fabio. Thank you, Parnassus. And thanks to everybody for tuning in. Thank you so much. And thank you, Ezra, for bringing this book to English. It's a pleasure yeah. working with you. And thank you for the interview. Thank you for Parnassus and everybody. Everybody. Take care. Have a good night, everyone.